reverse engineering protocols followed by assay art for beginners so it's all yours so all righty hey everybody um welcome to my talk i am net spooky and i'm here to give some talks about reverse engineering unknown protocols and ascii art for beginners so i spoke at last con it was really awesome big thank you to leslie and everybody who's doing this this has been awesome to, to watch all the talks have been great um and so yeah if anybody here has any questions too i'll have a q a at the end uh, hopefully if you have anything um or if not you can always hit me up on twitter so okay let's get started so first who am i uh simple i'm net spooky our website is no.lol or n0.lol um we'll just get right into it because i don't have too much time i have a lot of content to fit into this uh your thing so reverse engineering on protocols this is kind of like the the staging bit for it. So, you know, it's hard to sometimes understand why you would want to do something like this. So basically, has this ever happened to you? <laughs> Peering into the void. So if you're seeing any strange requests in your logs, or you notice something that doesn't really look right in Wireshark, uh, or you have some devices that are speaking in some strange language or some software talking to a server in a you know binary protocol, maybe some malware even. Um, you might search online, just you know, look up ports and, and different elements of the message, and you don't find anything. Or you might find something, but it doesn't really seem to match up with what you're seeing, and you start to feel a little bit unnerved. Um, so a lot of people, when they are come across a situation, might feel like they can't really do anything about it, and so they just kind of give up, um, or they don't really have time for it. Um, but today, after this talk, hopefully you will be a bit more um, apt to, to actually want to go in and investigate these kind of protocols. Um, so when you look at a protocol, you got to ask yourself, like, what are you looking at here? So for me, I do protocol reversing professionally. And I, hold on one moment. I, um, I had to do a lot of um, sort of like research and, and just study into this field to kind of put it into something that is like, I guess, able to be shared with all, all other people as well too. So I, I do a lot of things with 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 classifying languages or, or protocols as languages and uh, you know writing to sectors and things. And so the kind of some of the things that I really like the, the, the ground truth for it is really that like protocols are just like a language where they are meant to make sense to somebody. So you might see like a big mess of you know binary characters and you might think like I don't know what this could possibly mean, but there's going to be something somewhere that this is meant to make sense to it might only be meant to make sense to one person but still it's supposed to make sense to somebody to a computer um whatever so there are certain characteristics that are part of every language um and so like you know there's different things like verb order or like how how words are are constructed and things like that and so not every language has every characteristic but there's like a general sense of how things are going to be naturally designed and so being aware of them like really helps to just understand how something might be structured. Um, and so archaeologists and linguists, people who look up dead languages, things like hieroglyphics, you know, they understood how languages are structured. And so they're able to piece out things based on, on different analysis techniques and uh, existing language, um, linguistic knowledge to be able to figure out how something would have been written or spoken, even if it hadn't been anybody had used it in over a thousand years. Um, and so with this whole thing, with, there's a lot to it. And so it's really important early on when you're looking at a protocol to establish your goal. So you got to ask yourself, like, what are you looking for here? So you might be just trying to get a basic understanding of traffic so you can classify it, uh, maybe even put up a firewall rule for, you know, detecting something or, um, you know, some sort of like a network uh, monitoring alert. Um, you can also try to decode the traffic into something meaningful. Um, you might be trying to expand in the existing knowledge of a previously unknown or proprietary protocol, or you might even be looking to find vulns in the protocol, which is always interesting too. So the first and foremost thing that you got to do with this is collect data. Um, there's some tools for collecting data. Well, collecting data would be through TCP dump or Wireshark. There's other tools that you can use as well. Um, those are my two main ones. And then you can use Network Miner to also enumerate data from, uh, from Wireshark or other PCAPs. Um, there's a lot of tools in this, so these are like just my basic go-tos here. But the point is to collect and isolate the traffic that you're trying to find. Um, there are more information about. Um, you want to find where the weirdness is in your in your PCAPs and uh, really just hone into it and, and look at it. 
Um, you want to get a really detailed view of, uh, you know, sessions, ports, protocols, things like that, just so you can have like a baseline understanding. Um, I usually, when I'm doing something like this, I'll, I'll you know, create a capture filter on something um, after I notice, you know, something I, I could try to like find out like, okay, what else is communicating on this port or has this value here and try to like get a lot of data and try to make it as specific as possible. Um, and so a lot of this is like a Sudoku puzzle. I usually compare it to where you get some of the data, some of the information, but you have to like lay it out and you have to put, um, you know, the un you have to fill in the blanks basically as you're, you're uh, going through the packets here. So hold on. So when it comes to, as I said before, with like the, the different patterns and, and constructs and, and language, there's a lot of design patterns that are going to be in protocols. And so people who design protocols, they typically follow a certain, you know, design things that are going to be helpful, not only from a, um, just like a general sensibility perspective, but also for the medium. Like if they only have a certain, you know, transfer rate, they might want to use smaller data sizes and, and smaller packet chunks. Or if they have something that might be noisy, they might want to have a bit more um, like error correction and things like that. So there's a lot of paradigms. The most common one that you usually see is like around like a like tag length and value. So like a tag would be something like say uh, a message type or an opcode. The length is the length of the overall packet or the message itself. And then the value is the actual data you're going to transfer. Um, usually uh, a lot of pack or a lot of protocols will have a header of some sort. Um, they can contain things like links or checksums or or opcodes, a uh, routing info. Um, You'll oftentimes find too um, delimiters and padding. The same thing. Reason we have punctuation, um, so we can add, you know, where where certain thoughts and ideas begin and end. Um, you also have support for different uh, data types and, and fields. Um, there might be ranges within a value, like um, like say like a, a one byte might only be able to be expressed between you know zero and zero x ten. Um, there's also encapsulation and wrapper protocols that you might have to you know can tend to and, and use as well and have a, have some other sub protocols that, that deal with that kind of stuff. Um, and there's also just endian this too. There's a big endian, which is like network byte order, which is like, you'll usually see that with network based applications, things will be big endian or little endian, um, and they can be mixed within the same message. It gets really confusing. Um, so the main thing I guess I want to talk about, and these are like the, the, the lexical pieces that we'll, we'll pull together um, for the demo in a second. Um, and so when looking at a protocol, it's really important to keep like the logical elements in mind because they can help you kind of make sense of what you're looking at here. And so we have like data types and sizes. So there's like the size of fields in a given packet. Um, like typically you'll see things that are like one or two or four or eight bytes in length. Um, there's like other variable length ones too, but those are like standardized block sizes. Um, there are also variable, um, uh, the variable stuff has uh, the link stored before it usually, um, like in the tad link value paradigm there. Um, you'll find like sequence numbers and message IDs, and those are used to keep track of the uh, order of messages. Um, you know, session IDs are used to keep track of individual sessions, so you can usually look for the same value only ever transmitted by one conversation or one host as the session ID. Um, there's authentication data, which is any credentials used to authenticate to the host. Um, message types are um, anything that uh, is a specific value associated with a type of data that's within a message. Um, function codes are commands that are given to a host. Um, they might specify like some operation to be done in the future. Um, they can be anything from a single byte to like a full string or a series of strings with parameters. Um, and there's checksums that are used to verify the integrity of data. Um, there can be encryption, which is pretty hard to track sometimes. Well, you can kind of look at, at just different ways of, of verifying that something is actually encrypted or not, um, but that's just something to be aware of in this too. Um, unicast and multicast, like anything that's like, some messages might be different if they're sent from one device to another versus um, sent to the whole network of messages. Um, there's chunk data and streams, which are just for like file uploads and real-time data. Um, examining how that stuff is handled is really useful too. You might be able to like extract entire files from a packet. Um, so following sessions in Wireshark is good. Um, flags can be some sort of like fluctuating values of like a single bit or more that are within a specified like byte. So usually flags will be in like a one or two byte kind of thing and you'll see like a Boolean like, 
either like one or zero on one bit. Um, and then there's also padding as well, which we said before, which can help to like space out certain uh, data types and data fields. And then record counts are the uh, number of records in, in a message. And one second. Perfect, okay. So the example here I have, just a really quick one is TLS. Um, this is my favorite write-up, by the way, of any write-up. It's just very well done. It's the traffic analysis of an SSL slash TLS session. Um, real simple over here. Um, this is like the protocol format. So there's like these record type values and then the hex for it. Um, there's versions and all this sort of stuff is just transmitted within this five byte, um, you know, binary chunk here. Um, and then within there, this is encapsulated this alert layer, which is just two bytes that explains um, you know, the severity of an alert and then the alert description. So here, this is just like a record um, or a, uh, an example here with the record and alert layer um, that is just saying like a warning that the certificate is, is bad or it's, uh, yeah, it's a bad certificate. And um, it's actually funny because this fourth bit website doesn't have an SSL cert, so you kind of get this message too. Um, but this translates directly to something like this, where you have, uh, you know, you see the cert name invalid, right? It's just a bad cert. Um, but this sort of thing here, you can just read through and read the spec and see that there is, uh, you know, the hex value for, um, what's it called? Hold on one second, my computer's really being really weird. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, you can see this, uh, the, the hex message here is, is in this lookup table here, and this is within the spec itself. Um, so not everything's gonna have a spec, but this is just kind of like how these sort of things that I had explained before kind of go um, and are actually implemented. There's like the record type, and there's like the links and the, the values and things like that. Um, and so it's really important though to remember that there's just because something has a spec doesn't mean that the implementations actually follow it. Um, there's a really big battle between like the protocol specs, the hardware and software implementations and the type of traffic you actually see. And this goes whether or not it's a documented spec with an RFC or it's a proprietary protocol, there could still be errors and things. So not everything can be really set in stone. And that's why it's really important for you as a reverse engineer to look at the way that things are actually happening in the wire. Um, so here's some simple RE techniques. I'm not gonna go over them, but you can do things like traffic manipulation, like on the wire, um, protocol fuzzing, which is a lot of fun. And then you can also RE like the software, the drivers or the hardware to figure out how protocol stacks are implemented um, by various components of uh, that speak um, the protocol. And so the thing we're gonna focus on for this demo here is analysis technique. So there's really basic stuff um, to just anal analyze like the, the different components of a protocol. And so we have things like frequency analysis, which is how often does a value appear at a specific location. Um, we also have length analysis, which is just like how long are the different messages and um, you know different sizes and things like that. And then the, my favorite one is differential analysis, which kind of uses both of these two, which are what are the specific differences between similar looking messages. And so we'll do this demo here with PDIF. Um, and one second, let me just pull it up here. Okay. So, oh, <laughs> forgot. So PDIF is a tool that I wrote um, earlier this year. That's just a binary protocol differ. And so what this does is it just helps with the differential analysis, which um, I can demo, but it's it's a uh, github.com slash netspooky slash PDIF. Um, and so, if we're going to be doing this, well, let me grab my demo one-liners. Um, well, first we can take a look here at um, at this PCAP and then we'll use PDIF for it. Sorry about that. Um, so this here is a protocol um, that's a stock ticker protocol, I think. I don't really know. Um, but I found this PCAP randomly and it, uh, it has just random fields in here. Uh, hold on. Like my, my Wireshark can't dissect it, but I know that there's data here. And so let me just move this over here. So if we're going through, um, when we're looking at like a, a, a PCAP, one of the first things that I usually try to do is just try to see like who's talking to who. And so we see that there's a source and the destination 
are actually the same. It looks like it's just like a one-way UDP session. Um, and we see things like the links here, like links 58, 41, 45, um, the different sizes of messages. Um, what I typically try to do is just scroll down and try to look at the dump here. So we notice the data is right here. We just scroll down and this kind of gives you like a better idea of like what is actually, um, like what kind of data you're actually looking at here. And so the payload here, if you look, if you notice the first like 16 bytes seem to be almost exactly the same. That 30, 30, 30, 30, and then all the way down to 1CDE just all seem to be exactly the same. And then the these bytes right here, um, hold on, like this, can't really select it. Um, these two though are, um, they seem to be incrementing in some way. So it's like 3DB, 3DC, 3DD, et cetera. Um, and then there's a lot of stuff that stays the same as well, like all these zeros and stuff. And so what's tough about this is that like, you know, when you look at something like this as a, like a beginner or somebody who's just getting into it, it can look just overwhelming because it doesn't really like tell you much. There's just like some random like ASCII and then there's a bunch of just bytes, right? Um, so for a tool like PDIF, what you can do is, let me just clear this real quick. Um, you can run this on this PCAP. And what this will do is it will take the, it'll basically count all the bytes in this data portion. So like, you know how we saw that 30, 30, 30, that's like the same. If you look at every, all 62 bytes in this packet, um, byte zero is always 30. And it's actually always the same for those first 16 bytes here, um, which is good because we just are able to determine that right away. That's what we were able to see with our eyes, but sometimes um, for really big PCAPs, especially, it's hard to you know go through and scroll through the entire thing and figure out what it's saying. Um, but so we started to see some more interesting stuff here. We saw that stuff that was incrementing and we see how they're in order here. These things that are in order uh, are probably like a sequence number or like a message ID of some sort that counts because if you see here, this one will order it by with the first occurrence of it and then it'll just kind of go in alphabetical order down. So we're seeing here that there is a, um, you know, what appears to be a sequence number of, of some sort. Um, and what I do know, because I, I truncated this PCAP, but this actually, this also increments as well. So we know that there's at least a two byte um, sequence ID here. Um, and then we see other stuff where there's padding and things like that. Um, but then, hold on one second. We can also go through and look at the other things that are staying the same, like right here, there's like a, a zero. So we know that there's always a zero here. And then there's either a zero or a two. Um, this is always the same here as well, this 37. And then there's for some reason a 25 and a 24 as well. Um, and so you can start to see, you know, you're going through this, um, that there are these certain patterns and, and delimiters and things like that. Um, we have like a zero that's a delimiter here, um, but it also, a zero next to like one number like this um, could also mean that the field length is like two bytes or something like that. Um, we have stuff like, so kind of go through what I already know about this of having enumerated this, is that we have stuff like this here where there's always a zero and then there's like a one or a two. And so if we look at say, hold on. You can do a, uh, a Wireshark thing for whatever here has two. And we notice that there are, um, you know, there's a two here and that's followed by 13, right? And so something that I try to look for in these kind of packets is what is a, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, like a length of the rest of the packet. And so that sort of stuff here is um, the length of the rest of the packet is at this field normally. So if we go to like, say right here, there's zero one and then zero two four. Um, two four, you notice there's, this is like one zero. And then this is also another one zero. So this is 20 and then four. So in hex it's two four. Um, it's tr like tricky to eyeball, but you kind of just get the hang of it as you look through here and see, you know, certain consistent values. And then you can kind of like calculate, you know, the rest of the packet length and things like that are always stuff to look out for. 
And I realized that I'm already almost at halfway through this thing. Um, so hold on. Um, so, all right. So doing all this stuff here, going through is a really good first step for just establishing the baseline of stuff here. We can see in the PCAP, we know that there's like a, this sort of long session ID or something right up here, but 0, 0, 007 or 525B. Um, that's like the session or you know token or something that might be transmitted. But we know that's always consistent. We know that there's consistent zeros and things like that. I mean, you can use that to um, establish like a very baseline thing with the protocol spec. So we can see like session ID. We know that some things are unknown, but they're always the same. And when you're trying to go through this, you kind of want to like just space out, you know, different fields that you notice consistencies at and just throw them into like a, a little grid. You can put them in an Excel spreadsheet. And then you can use that to, you know, build the sectors as well as, you know, guide the rest of your, of your stuff. But it's really good to take good notes of all this kind of thing, just so you can know where data is appearing. Um, and so I'm already out of time on this specific talk and I knew I was going to because I have way too much info for this one. Um, so I might do a class or something like this in the future or like a presentation. So um, hit me up if you're more interested in this. This probably wasn't the best uh, way to present it. So one moment while I switch over to the next one. All right, so I should be able to just breeze through this one because <laughs> I was like realizing halfway through this that I was completely not on time for what I was trying to, to finish here. So ASCII art for beginners. Um, ASCII art is something that I've been doing for a long time and I've been wanting to share more info about it um, with people just because people ask me all the time like how I do things. Um, and so I kind of wanted to do a quick overview of like what is actually available um, in terms of ASCII art to like you know, what kind of styles and tools and things. And so you might've seen stuff I've done before. Um, here's like a fake a fake uh, uh, DNS server um, for a CTF that was returning uh, ASCII art of Gucci Mane and some text records and DNS. Um, but stuff like this, there's a lot of ways to liven up the things that you do. And so I tend to just add ASCII art to everything and just see, you know, if, it, if the team will appreciate it. Um, so, all right, let's go into some styles real quick. So um, it's basically like different styles of ASCII art. Um, this line-based style is kind of a, um, a bit more common in like older ASCII art. Um, there's a lot of examples here. Um, I, so most of the examples in this I, I made myself, but most of them on this page I did not. Um, like this, uh, this Tor one down here or the, uh, the goose that Gilda put into um, my Metasploit or this uh, cityscape that Zero made. Um, so we have this line-based, you know, sh line-shaped characters that are used to create like a bigger structure. Um, so this is a style that I, I usually like to, to just kind of experiment with. There's a lot of really cool fonts for it. Um, there's also solid and shaded. So you'll see a lot of this kind of stuff in um, like a, an ASCII art generator. Um, so you'll see in here, like these are kind of like a rough approximations of stuff um, that are used with the actual letters to do like the shading portions of it. Um, oops, uh, ANSI art is a lot of, there's too much to cover in ANSI art. So I'm just gonna like leave it to you, you to, uh, to go to 16 colors and, and look at some of the history of ANSI art. But it's basically using block elements and ANSI colors um, to create terminal art. Um, and so one of my favorites one is this DEF CON one that uh, my friend Zero made um, that has like a QR code written in ANSI. It's so cool. Um, but yeah, these are these are done in with like block elements um, that you might have seen in you know Twitter and stuff too, or in other ANSI art. Um, but they're a lot of fun. Um, Kaomoji, I really like too. This is like the Japanese style of like emoticon. So You'll see like a kind of like a line based stuff, but they use like a large Unicode char set to, to really like make stuff happen. So if you can see this, my favorite Twitter is twit uh, underscore bot. It's um, they just tweet out constantly all this kind of stuff and it's amazing. Um, it's very, very expressive because they use pretty much everything in Unicode, but it can also fit into small spaces like tweets. So you might have seen a lot of this stuff, um, you know, people posting variations of it. 
Um, they're really popular. And there's actually a really sick repository. My favorite um, a collection, I guess, of uh, Kamoji <laughs> is the CIA Vault 7 leak, which for some reason just has this Japanese style faces page, uh, I guess, for talking to people on Japanese chats. Um, but they have like some of the best Kamojis, so <laughs> you can use those as a starting point if you want to play with them. Um, things with unique char sets are a lot of fun to play with too. So early computers had their own char sets with unique glyphs in them for expressing parts of the UI and stuff like that. Um, Petski is a really good example of that, um, Commodore Petski. Um, Amiga fonts were also really well known for unique spacing and characters. Um, and then this font Unski I really like because it tries to mimic some custom char sets here by adding like random stuff like uh, like triangles and, and portions of triangles so you can do interesting effects like this here. Um, so tools are really important. So ASCII art generators, these are things that there's quite a few of them. So I kind of want to just go over them. Um, generators can make design decisions for you and make it a lot easier to do ASCII art designs, but the decisions can be flawed and the outcomes can be really weird. Um, they often need a lot of space to make an image look right just because images now are pretty high resolution and they have a pretty hard time expressing small shapes. Um, image artifacts can also cause like uh, rendering issues too. So if you have like say, like a just a random block of, uh, you know, stuff that's just a little bit shaded differently from the background, um, due to compression or something, that can just add randomly some different block that's generated uh, in the generator. Um, so manual cleanup can make the output a lot smoother, um, and also just using it for small shapes too is, is, is pretty okay, but it's definitely tricky. Um, some examples of ASCII art generated stuff is this. So I have like uh, this bot eye, um, looks like an anime girl, and then uh, DJ Khaled's head with uh, another one. So editors are really important too. Um, I use Sublime Text 3 for most of my stuff because I can do regex, uh, I can do column select, which if you do shift and right click in Sublime Text, you can do a column select and, and select and replace things like that. Um, we can do configurable line spacing and it's really it's really nice for, for just doing layouts and things like that. Um, Moebius is an ANSI editor that uh, I use pretty much exclusively now for my ANSI art. Uh, older ones are Pablo Draw, which is um, also really cool. There's a lot of features in there as well. And then there's Petmate for Petski if you're interested in that too. Um, so here's an example of using Moebius uh, to draw some VX Underground fan art. Um, this is the Slayer logo with VX Underground. Uh, uh, but yeah, so here's a general interface. You can kind of just draw. It's almost like a Microsoft Paint or something. Um, you can just use it to like make different shapes and stuff as well as like shade and color stuff in. Um, so Figlet fonts are the like next big thing that you might have seen a lot of. Um, they've been around since the early 90s. There's a lot of different fonts. Um, and you can modify them and create your own. And I, I really like creating Figlet fonts, although I haven't released too many of them. Um, but they're a lot of fun to just like generate. Um, this padorjk.com, um, like the ASCII art generator, um, can do Figlet fonts in the browser. And there's also a really handy Figlet editor that I use a lot for laying out Figlet fonts. And my friend Zero as well has his own Figlet font uh, repository, which you can see here. There's a ton of different just random fonts that you can use in the terminal. Um, here's some examples of designs of some fonts I did recently. One of the, the top one is, uh, is based on Link's Awakening um, Zelda font that I was working on. And then another one is based on this uh, N64 like BIOS font that my friend found. Um, so if you look at here, there's like the layout of how like uh, the Figlet font files are actually done. Um, so if you want to create your own, there's a bunch of stuff that you kind of need to know, um, keep in mind, but it's really important to just kind of experiment too. Um, the most important thing is to know your medium and its limitations and the features. So if you want to do something on like the terminal or the web or social media or whatever, um, there's limitations all over the place for those. And you have to kind of just keep in mind how people are going to see them um, or how you're going to transport them and how people are going to view them. Um, so 80 chars is like the standard for terminal things just because that's just been the standard forever. Um, I tend to stick to 80 characters in terminal stuff just because I like to use things on random small computers too. And so if you have like perfectly spaced art that's 80 by 24, um, it can look really nice in like a, a small screen. Um, the widths are standard for standards. Uh, there's like standard widths for sites like Twitter. 
Um, like so, like if you view something in the mobile app versus viewing it in the uh, web app, you know things might look differently or shift, and it takes a bit of experimentation. There's also character limits too, like 280 characters for Twitter, uh, 2,000 for Discord, 4,000 for Slack. Um, so those are all like things to just keep in mind when you're making something. Um, knowing your char sets, like if you can only use ASCII, then you have to kind of stick within those bounds. Otherwise, you might get some weird errors. Um, or you might be using some encoding that has different char um, character sets in there as well. Um, but those are all like just super important to keep in mind. A lot of the times people are use, using UTF-8 now, which is pretty cool because um, it's kind of standardized, but you might find that there are cool characters that you can't use in UTF-8 and vice versa. Um, and knowing your fonts is also really important too. Um, I have some suggestions later on. So here's an example, and actually you guys can use this too. <clears throat> My website, no.lol or n0.lol slash t slash slack emoji converter. I redid the font for this tool. Somebody had written a tool and I had changed the font so it was a bit smaller, um, but this is for making slack emoji um, blocks. So we have this thing that says like stonks that's written in like Bitcoin or rip to prod with that little rip gifts. Um, stuff like that though, is like a you know perfectly valid ASCII art. Um, the other things you need to know too, so beyond that kind of stuff is if you're doing something in the terminal or doing something for, um, it's gonna be like in source code or something is um, <clears throat> to know like your, your lines and blocks. So there's like box drawing characters and block elements that is a really good Wikipedia page that I always reference for these things. Um, knowing your basic shapes is really good too, like knowing how to make a square or a plus or a you know, triangle or this uh, shading over here um, is really just useful to play around with. Um, but super important is to know your ANSI escape codes to like actually color stuff in. Um, so you can add a lot of flair to your own um, you know, source code and other terminal applications with, uh, with ANSI or, or the ANSI codes here. Um, if you're gonna do something on a web page, um, it's really simple to set up uh, like a text art on the web. Um, so there's fonts like Unsky, Topaz Plus, there's other really cool um, fonts that are here at int10h.org um, for old, interesting monospaced fonts. Also, you can feel free to steal any CSS from null.lol or thugcrowd.com because I did all the ANSI art there um, or most of it on thugcrowd. Um, and you can um, you know, feel free to use that if you want to put this kind of stuff uh, on your own website. Um, there's also something to be aware of too, just something I was dealing with the other day is subpixel blur in CSS for some bitmap fonts and other um, like old school fonts. Um, they're like specifically designed to be at a very, very like specific uh, pixel um, range. And so sometimes you try to like center it or move it weird, your browser will start to like make it look really blurry. Um, so here's some examples <laughs> of some web page stuff I've done. Um, there's tons of different weird styles. All this stuff is done with CSS. Um, I used to do the Doug Crowd show notes. Um, so I would just make stuff like this every week and just kind of experiment with things. Um, this is how I really realistically learned how to do most of the stuff was just by having an application for it. But if you have like tools and things you want to add, you know, your own art to, this is like a really you know, you have to have like a good reason, I guess, to, to get into it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different styles I used here as well. You can see all of those on thugcred.com slash notes. Um, but yeah, so this is a lot of stuff that I've done. I've been, I've also been asked to do uh, layouts for other websites as well and zines. Um, but I like using web pages because you can, you can experiment with like different colors and effects. Like I only really use CSS, but you're able to use like CSS to do weird stuff like this, uh, the glowing pink cursive, like sleazy Miami thug crowd uh, um, logo. That one is done with just CSS, like WebKit basic stuff. Um, there's also like uh, different like color gradients and stuff that you can implement with CSS too that you can't really do with, with ANSI art as much. So I typically prefer to do it like this, um, but you might be having different applications for it. It's not, trans it's not really easy to transport stuff from the web to ANSI, but you can use ANSI to HTML um, generators to create HTML pages out of ANSI, which is cool. Um, so yeah, on the terminal itself, you can use just an ANSI file, like MoEBS and Pablo Java will generate them. 
Um, they're like binary file formats, um, but you can also do stuff like having a script to generate it at runtime. Um, and so I like to do that. That's, that can be fun um, for different reasons, but it depends on your application really. Um, I also really like to add ASCII art to comments or you know spice up my source code. Um, and you, know, you can also embed stuff so it can only be viewed by certain tools. So um, I've done documentation and stuff too. Like here's um, the big one in the top right is, uh, is like the Python 3 PyC format. And it's really cool to use like ANSI escape codes and stuff like that to color in documentation because um, it can make you know normally really boring looking blobs of, of hex um, look really cool with uh, and, and readable with, with all these colors and layouts and things. But I've also just colored in randomly too, like write ups and things as well, just so you can easily see stuff. Because if you're working with like big blobs of binary data and stuff like that, you want to color it in and make it look nice. Um, and then you can use curl to. Uh, to you know, directly transmit ANSI and, and put it into the terminal stuff. Um, you can also use like, this is an example of like raw escape. So you can use in your file, so you can even color within your source code and it'll also render the same if you just run the script as well. Um, there's a lot of really cool uses for it. Um, and yeah, here's some more examples of, uh, of just terminal art. So you may, may have seen my inhale.py um, with the animated Kirby mouth by using the blink, there's a blink uh, option for text in um, ANSI. And so the mouth blinks basically, and it seems to open and close. Um, there's some other just random layout stuff that I've done um, over the years. Um, this one was pretty cool too. This is just a script, as I was saying before, to generate stuff. So this is, <laughs> this is a little bit overkill, but this is a uh, Tentamon from Digimon that's been drawn and then it has this crazy script, this Python script that actually runs and generates it, um, which is a lot of fun. Um, and then the final thing that I had said too was uh, making your source code look really crazy. So I like, there's a lot of languages you can do this with and there's different, like the IOC CCC or the uh, International Obfuscated C Code Contest is like known for really crazy art like this. Um, but there's a lot of ways that you can do it with stuff that isn't C. Um, there's a lot of weird stuff like with Python, you can append strings together like that without a plus, but then you can use that to make a eyes or like mouths or whatever in like a block of, of you know, a payload like that. Um, and then you can use this to basically, like <laughs> the top left one was a joke really. It was the, the most complicated hello world I could think of. Um, but then there's also stuff like this with this different variables and in arrays, you can make like keys or skulls. Um, you can also just, I like to put stuff in, in like embed things in the source code too, um, just random comments. So if you've ever seen a page I ever made, definitely check the source because I always put like random YouTube links or drawings in there. Um, also really fun too is to make stuff so you can only see it in certain tools. So um, right here, this is things as mafia. This originally said hex dump mafia or something like that. Um, but this was embedded inside of a binary. And so you wouldn't be able to normally see this in a text editor if you opened it up. But if you open it up in a hex editor, then you'd be able to see that it spells out this and it's spaced to 16, basically. Um, one of my favorite ones I did recently um, was this PCAP scroller. And so it sends, um, it sends basically a message that scrolls and it says like, you're reading PCAPs, I'm reading your emails, we're not the same, but it scrolls it in that where that little O is in the hex dump of, uh, of Wireshark, and it just, it's perfectly spaced. Um, that kind of stuff is always fun too, um, just for trolling and things. Um, and so yeah, the last thing is some editors like Moebius can export your works to an image file. Other times you need to take screenshots. Um, sometimes, you, like, for some reason, ASCII art can be rendered really weird. Like, if you look at, uh, like, like here, if you see like the screenshot with, um, this wasn't the best screenshot in the world, but is a screenshot of Kirby, it has lines in it. There's other times, um, other fonts and configurations you can use that can get rid of those. Um, same with the blocks that are sometimes in some of the bigger ANSI art stuff that you might do on um, on the web on a web page. Um, but yeah, you kind of want to like figure out what the best medium is to do your images. Um, Moe BS takes care of it for you, but other times when you take screenshots, you actually like have that in mind. And so with that, um, I think I'm done. 
All right, that was great. Uh, I don't see a whole lot of uh, questions in the chat, but it looks like people are super excited about both of the things that you talked about, especially the ASCII art stuff, which is super fun. And I'm going to exploit the Slack one all the time in my work Slack. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, super cool. And uh, if anyone else comes up with any questions, looks like we may have one question, but we're uh, trying to track that one down. Yeah, if anyone else has any questions, let us know in the chat. All right, let's see, there's the link. Uh, can you elaborate on how to go about analyzing and or interacting with malicious binaries that does C2 over a non-standard protocol using a malicious DLL? For example, how do you go about analyzing the switch tables, for example, in the disassembled DLL code that represent various switch cases based on the specific bytes received? All right, so that's a really, really good question. And this is, so I had written this talk and I was like, this is not going to fit into 20 minutes because there's way too much that I want to do. So again, if you guys are interested in that specific topic, I will do a presentation. I might just do like a Twitch stream or something where people can ask me anything, or I might do a private Zoom call. Um, but so for malware specifically, if you have a you know switch table, things like that, there are definitely paradigms that you can recognize when you're doing analyzing, you know, like basically comparing values um, is like a big thing that you'll see within malware itself. So like compare EAX to like some other, you know, value like one or two or whatever, and then jump to somewhere else. So you can see those things. Um, you can, you know, you kind of have to look at if you're actually analyzing the malware, look at how it's iterating over the buffer of data that it received, right? So you want to see like wherever the receive from buffer is in memory or on the stack or wherever, you want to see where that is and then you want to just watch it iterate over the packet because it's going to have to compare to stuff in a jump table um, there might be some other obfuscation but in a classical form you'll see it like that um, and it'll jump to like another function and then you can map out and say okay if this if byte 12 is 0x15 then it jumps to this address and you can you can map that stuff out with a, a table but um, it's really important though to find the exact place where the buffer goes um, into the binary because there might be other transformations that are done too like it might decrypt it with a zor key or some other key um, and you can just looking at that communication is, is really useful to see how it's actually processed and handled um, looking at it from a forward perspective of how it's created sometimes that can be really crazy um, and so it's usually i like to look at how it's decoded rather than it's encoded um, just because it gives a more straightforward way of the easiest path to get the data. Um, but yeah, you can usually just take whatever that buffer is and compare it to what you see on the wire too and, and see how that changes over uh, in memory. All right, super cool. I have no idea what you were actually talking about, but I'm sure somebody does. <laughs> so, yeah, that was great.